Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret, and today we come to Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 1. So get your Bible, if you can, open it up to Ecclesiastes chapter 4. The Scripture Verse by Verse website is found at thebibleversebyverse.com. You can study all of the Bible with me verse by verse. That's right, all 31,000 plus verses in the English Bible. You can study with me using my audio Bible messages at the Bible verse by verse dot com. Four series going through the entire Bible. Archives from over 35 years are there for you to choose from. Choose, click, and listen. It's all you need to do, and all you need to bring is your Bible to the Bible verse by verse dot com. And Father, we pray that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Ecclesiastes 4, 1. So I returned and considered all the oppressions that are done under the sun. And behold, the tears of such as were oppressed, and they had no comforter, and on the side of their oppressors there was power, but they had no comforters. Solomon looks around the world and sees things as they actually are, and he's very observant, which is why he said, with much wisdom comes much sorrow, because you see things that people who have no wisdom or simply don't care enough to look don't understand, don't see. So he looks around, and he's very, he's very disappointed. Uh, add to that the unfairness that he has seen in, his, in this life, and so he concludes that the human condition is bad. It is bad under the sun. In other words, it is bad when this life is all there is. And that's how you're looking at it. It's bad. It's really bad when you exclude God from your life because if this is all there is, then you are to be pitied above all people. He realized that his life, as he looked around without God, he realized that his life was not only meaningless, but it was also hopeless. And then, taking a more careful look, there was cruelty on top of it all. On top of all the meaninglessness and hopelessness, there's cruelty. Life goes from meaningless on the one end to tragic on the other end. Solomon saw it. He took the time to observe it. And he was right on target with his conclusion under the sun. That is, apart from God. Because when God is in your life, when you have repented and received Jesus Christ, as Lord and Savior, then even unfair treatment and sorrow, suffering, is not an end in itself. It's a means to a greater good through the sovereignty of God. But without God, my goodness, it's a lost cause. And it's a miserable lost cause and a meaningless lost cause. I wouldn't change life with the Lord Jesus Christ for anything in the world. I've been there for the first 25 years of my life. No, thank you. Verse 2. Wherefore, I praised the dead, which are already dead, more than the living, which are yet alive. Solomon came to the conclusion that if you are unhappy, then you are better off dead than alive. And again, hasten to remind you, 
that this is the viewpoint of one who has no thought of God, God does not enter into his mind, and life begins and ends in this world and this world only. If you, if you, if you come at life from that perspective, you come at life from the point of view of someone who excludes God and thinks there is no God or doesn't care if there is a God, then I suppose death is better than a miserable life because you're not afraid of dying. Of course, that's completely wrong because there's a whole lot worse out there waiting for the person who rejects God and Christ than just a miserable life here. There's the eternal lake of fire, which will make this life seem like a cakewalk, no matter how miserable your life may be. So again, he's looking at this from the point of view, from someone who doesn't know God, doesn't care about God, and excludes God from every aspect of his life. Three, yea, better is he than both they, which has not yet been who has not seen the evil work that is done under the sun. So from the point of view of one who doesn't believe in God, a bad life is worse than no life at all. That's what he's saying. I mean, if the goal is extinction, if the end result is extinction, totally annihilated, from existence, then you're better off not being born in the first place than taking the long, frustrating road through an unhappy life to get to complete and total extinction. Why go through the intermediate period? Better off never being born at all. Well, that's a miserable life to come at it that way, but without God, I mean, what else can you conclude? What a horrible way to look at things, and what a false way to look at things. And yet, when you think about it, and Solomon is being logical, it is a logical attitude of those who exclude God from their life. The only, the only difference between Solomon and most other atheists or practical atheists is that he's being honest. This is terrible. He's, there's no pretense with Solomon. For Again, I considered all travail and every right work, that for this a man is envied of his neighbor. This is also vanity and vexation of spirit. Here's the logical reasoning. Who doesn't believe in God or is a practical atheist lives as if there is no God. This is the logical reasoning of somebody like that who doesn't believe in God or acts like they don't believe in God and their attitude toward life or death. You're born with nothing. This is his conclusion. You're born with nothing. What you do while you are alive is meaningless in the end, and your future has no hope because when you die, you just enter into oblivion while your body is turning back to dust. No wonder so many people get drunk and do drugs. I probably would do the same thing if I thought this world was all there is. And that this truly was your best life. As that one very popular smiley face word of faith person promotes, your best life now. If that's what you believe, mister, this is your best life. I sure wouldn't want to be in you in eternity after you die for the garbage that you're preaching. Five, the fool folds his hands together and eats his own flesh. In other words, the fool has no one to blame for his misery except himself. If you live your life apart from God, then you will indeed be miserable 
and you will have no one to blame for that except yourself because you have rejected the testimony of nature and the testimony of conscience and the testimony of the written word of God to get to this unnatural state where you live your life as an atheist. And then you deserve all the misery that you're going to get. And you are going to get a bunch of it. Because it's not normal. It's not right. Six. Better is a handful with quietness than both hands full with travail and vexation of spirit. In other words, you are better off having relatively little and enjoying it. You're better off being in that situation than to work yourself to death in order to have a lot and then be too miserable and tired to enjoy it. Some people strive and work like crazy and labor so hard to obtain more and more stuff and they never take, to, never take the time to enjoy any of it. They always want more. They always try to ensure their future by having more and more and it's never enough and they're never content and they're never happy because they're looking for contentment and security and happiness in things which are fleeting instead of in God, who is eternal. So many people work their tails off to get a secure future, and meanwhile, they even squander the now that they have. It's true. And that certainly is meaningless and vanity. Seven, then I returned and I saw vanity under the sun. Solomon says, there's something else that bothers me. More vanity, which he has been talking about since the opening verse of this book. But he says there's even more. Well, what is it, Solomon? Eight. There is one alone, and there is not a second. Yea, he has neither child nor brother. Yet is there no end of all his labor. Neither is his eye satisfied with riches. Neither says he, for whom do I labor and bereave my soul of good? This is also vanity. Yea, it is a sore travail. How miserable and meaningless is this? How miserable and meaningless to work and work and accumulate more and more stuff, more and more riches, more and more things, and then be too miserable to enjoy it. And on top of everything else, they have no one to enjoy any of it with. There are many people who are deceived by their own greed. They think that more things will give them happiness but they find out it doesn't. They come up empty. It just doesn't work. It's like a dog chasing their tail. Nine, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. And this is absolutely true. Whether you're talking about friendship or marriage, and hopefully friendship and marriage go together. But you're going to have a better life if you have someone who is close to you, who you love and who loves you, and you can share things with. I suppose there are many reasons for that. But one reason is you're less likely to be selfish. If you have someone. And that alone will make your life better. The Bible says it's better to give than to receive. And in order to keep that relationship going well, both people have to be givers. So you're going to be less selfish and that'll make you happier. All by itself. That's, that's, that makes it better. See? For that reason alone, two are better than one. I'm sure this is not true in every single case, but some people stay single and live alone and don't want anybody else in their life because they're too selfish to want to share anything that they have or compromise with anyone in order to get along. 
They just want it all for themselves, everything the way they want it. And if that's what you want to do, I mean, that's fine. Go ahead. Selfishness isn't fine. That's a sin. And two are better than one, says God. But in order for two to be one and get along well and enjoy each other and enjoy what God gives them, there has to be a spirit of submissiveness, mutual submissiveness and sharing and kindness and unselfishness. Well, we'll stop right here for today. We'll pick it up in verse 10 next time. Remember, you can study all of the Bible with me verse by verse using my audio Bible messages. If you would like to be a part of this ministry that has been faithfully teaching the Word of God now for over 35 years, Scripture verse by verse, pray for me. Pray for God's Word because that will make you a part of this ministry right away. Also, when you take a break from studying at the Bible, verse by verse dot com. Go to the front page, click the donate button, and prayerfully give as the Lord may lead, because that also will make you a part of this ministry right away. Thank you for spending this time with me. I do, I do appreciate it, and I enjoy it. I hope you do. Until next time, so long, everyone.